Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Converge. I am delighted to have Benjamin Fernandez and my good friend, Mickey Tisfaya, with me today. Uh, Benjamin is the founder and CEO of Nala, which is a cross-border payments business that enables you to send money across the US, UK, Europe, and the continent of, continent of Africa, and is building payments infrastructure for those regions. Benjamin, thanks for joining. Give us uh, just a little bit more of an intro of yourself, and then I'll dive into our, our questions here. And Mickey, uh, good to have you back. You don't need to intro yourself because our audiences know you very well. <laughs> awesome. Hey, Mickey. Hey, Alex. Uh, great to connect. And yeah, really glad to be here. So quick background was I'm from Tanzania. I grew up there uh, when I was 17, got a scholarship that brought me to America for the first time for school and uh, started working in payments shortly after I had a small stint as a TV uh, as a TV host for a couple of years and uh, began a career in, in, in television, but then moved on to payments um, because if one goes from TV to payments uh, traditionally. Uh, we're in a, uh, but no, I got involved in payments because my boss had come and asked me, can we enable people to pay for a TV subscription on mobile money in Africa uh, through like their cell phone? And that's how I got involved in payments. And then I was like, oh, this is interesting. I just got really curious about it. And then that's how I started building. I mean, obviously a lot of things happened in the middle then and eventually started building Nala. Awesome. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Nala, I'd encourage you to go check them out uh, and you'll see some, some really interesting background to the company. Um, but what I observed, uh, Benjamin, was uh, some really great brand storytelling and marketing that sort of made a connection between um, the importance of, of payments and the efforts that uh, your company is making to unlock greater economic opportunity through payments improvements on the African continent. And then you make this parallel to the patience, consistency, and determination of elite athletes who have defined the African standard of excellence in many different sports on the world stage. Uh, and that video, I think it, particularly it was, it was running uh, or sprinting. So talk to me at a high level about that Build Our Africa campaign that you went out with recently and, and how Nala, your company, is motivated by the goals of this larger campaign and why payments is such a crucial part to building this Africa that you and many others envision for the future. Yeah, so thank you. That's very kind for you to share. Um, you know, I think, you know, um, as we think about Nala and how we hold ourselves to certain standards as an organization, a lot of it is defined in sports. Um, and I tell my team sometimes I use a lot of sports analogies, but, you know, we could be in the third league in the English league with one one thousandth the budget of somebody in the Premier League. How do we get to the Premier League and how do we enable uh like, you know, would be dominant in the Premier League. And the way I look at that directly is the African continent is the most expensive continent in the world to trade with. It's got 1.3 billion people today. It's going to be 2.5 billion by 2050. You know, a lot, a lot of challenges that's that's going to create. And um, the question it, it brings up to everybody is, okay, is the continent positioned to succeed? Um, net across, across uh, the world historically, um, Africa net on paper is, you know, not well positioned right now to succeed, even though they have a lot of natural resources, the region um, comes rich in wealth, uh, rich in talent, uh, but opportunities and equally distributed across the world. And so the question I ask myself and ask our team is, what can we do to enable that opportunity to be dispersed and shared? Um, you know, I'll give you a few examples. Mickey's right now in the UK, the UK, 52% of the tea that's drunk in the UK is imported from Kenya. And, you know, you're in the US, you, you probably hold an iPhone. Um, or have, you know, in, in the US, like you're in Seattle, a popular car there is Tesla. The Congo is the largest lithium ion producer in the world. And today, those batteries are imported from Cong to, imported to France from Congo, and then resold to the US uh, for Tesla, but resold to China for Apple uh, devices. And so how do you increase uh, net margins directly on the African continent in countries that are very mineral heavy or like rich with a lot of natural resources, but never see the the true margins of the wealth of what that distribution actually looks like. And that's just two examples I gave you. Um, I can give you a plethora of examples, you know, Ivory Coast uh, exports cashew nuts to Vietnam and Vietnam just repackages and resells it to Europe. 
uh, why can't the trades happen between Ivory Coast and Europe directly? And so I think, you know, financial services is a foundational element of global trade. And how do you enable these transactions to happen more directly, but also position the continent as a place of, um, you know, economic power globally? Um, and what can we do? So I really look at this from a payments landscape. And, you know, the whole journey about Build Africa is to enable that opportunity to be more equally distributed and enable the cost of global trade to Africa to reduce significantly, um, to enable more and more regions around the world to trade with Africa, but also enable local folks across the African continent who might be a podcaster like you creating amazing content in Nairobi, Kenya, but can't get paid on Instagram today. Um, and so what can we do to enable a service like Instagram in the US to be able to disperse into M-Pesa wallets locally in Africa. They're not going to come and com- connect to all the 54 countries, uh, 55 countries, depending on who you ask, across the continent, but can we disperse through one API that enables Instagram to operate in 10 countries in Africa tomorrow? Um, so those are the questions and the foundation behind the why for what we do, what we do, um, and really looking at, okay, how does this continent scale and evolve, especially with the, the fast-growing population? There's going to be new problems that are created and existed, and how we build payments that can support this directly. So when you say payments in Africa are 1% built, which is part of your uh, your taglines, is that a signal of the size of this opportunity ahead and what, you know, the, this, the sheer volume and, and size of the opportunity that you guys are tackling, basically? Yeah, I think I think it's a mixture of size, but also infrastructure just non-exist, not being there. Um, for example, mm-hmm. Alex, we set off on this journey about two and a half years ago to enable or build a remittance company initially just to support money that's getting sent to Africa. Now, to build a cross-border remittance company really well, you have to do two things. One, great pricing, which means foreign exchange fees, uh, foreign exchange rates. And the second one would be reliability. So Alex wants to know when he's sending money to Uganda that it's going to get delivered within X time period that is stated by the service. And while we were building this, we realized reliability was really bad across the continent. You know, in some of the best markets, you're seeing success rates about 88% at best. You know, 82 is probably more realistic. So imagine you're sending 10,000 transactions and, you know, only 8,000 are getting delivered successfully. What about those other 2,000 transactions? What's happening to those and why aren't they getting delivered successfully? And so while we were building this consumer remittance product, reliability across different partners, across different markets we operate in, we operate in nine countries in Africa today, we started to see a massive gap there. And a lot of it was technology uh, just missing for, let's say, automation of float balances, name validation checks, you know, checking bank queries for account balances before dispersing money to them. And a lot of that could be using technology to resolve. And so that's the question I started to ask myself. I was like, wow, there's a plethora of problems that Nala itself as one business will never be able to resolve. And so when I say payments is 1% built, I think that's just one case of just inner inbound payments. But what about outbound payments as well? Like until the world can trade more with Africa, Af- Africa is a net like a net import region. We import more than we export. There's only one country in Africa that exports more than imports, and that's Cote d'Ivoire. So, what can we do to uh, enable, for example, you know, you, you saw recently in the news, Emirates pulled out of Dubai because they couldn't repatriate funds uh, from sorry, Emirates pulled out of Nigeria because they couldn't repatriate funds to Dubai, um, and that begs a big question because let's say you're an, an importer uh, today you are importing motorcycles to send in, sell in Kenya. You need dollars to import. Um, and let's say th- Kenya in 2021 only exported $7 billion worth of goods and services, and their import value was $23 billion. So you have, you know, $16 billion trade deficit that you're trying to solve. And like, where is those dollars going to come from for importers to be able to source and be able to send those goods and uh, buy those goods and services out by sending those dollars to India, China, France, the US, etc. So I think, you know, until that problem gets resolved, like one of these companies will go to an airline and say like, hey, we want to send this money to, to the UK, let's say for British Airways. And the bank's like, okay, you can send $50,000. We don't, you can't send a million dollars. Now British Airways is frustrated because they can't repatriate funds and revenue that they collected in that local market. So when I say it's 1% built, I think 
there are so many unique challenges that the continent faces in the payments uh, landscape that limit the global world from trading with the African region, but also limit local businesses from successfully doing things uh, on an, in an optimal way. So a lot of the, the services you see in the US, UK, Europe um, don't exist in Africa in the majority of these countries. Uh, we could build 50 businesses in Africa that could each be building our businesses today just in the payment space. Uh, we will never be able to do that. And so that's why I think, you know, there's a lot more work uh, beyond us, beyond Nala. Um, and the way I look at 1% built is, are we building payment rails for the next 100 years? Like, are, you know, what does, you know, I, I, the analogy I use with the team is we want to be like Coca-Cola, like 100 years from today, did all these other businesses build on top of rails that we built uh, locally and, you know, supported people to trade, supported people to collect more revenue from merchant payments digitally instead of carrying cash everywhere. So yeah, that 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 that's the foundation behind the message of one percent build. You know that the one percent thing that you mentioned, Benji. You, we, you and I have talked a lot about this because I'm Ethiopian, um, and you know I see the challenges of the payments in um, my like the country I'm from, right? Like it's not even ninety nine percent cash; it's a hundred percent cash. But I guess when I'm like listening to you talk about this one percent, I always just ask myself, why is this the case? Because in part, the technology question doesn't map onto the issue, right? Because like Africa, M-Pesa came from Africa. Like Africa is like the global leader in mobile money. You know that I remember going to Kenya in like 2011 and my friend buying flowers with a Nokia and being, I was just like, I could not comprehend what was going on, right? So given that like in Africa, you've had some of these mad innovations that have actually really transformed a lot of the way we do business globally, the way we think about money and the, the the technology infrastructure that moves it, how come then we've had this gap that's emerged or sustained? For example, Africa is the most expensive place to send money to. So what is the underlying issue there? Yeah, I think there's so many, uh, Mickey, and that's a great point. So like, if you look at the GSMA data from 2022, I think the, the amount was $1.26 trillion has moved on mobile money globally. $839 billion is Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa alone. And then if you split that up, East Africa is like $436 billion. Uh, so that, that's Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, those markets. And um, East Africa grew 22% in 22, 2022 alone, right? Which is crazy when you're, you're looking at those type of volumes share as a net factor. But ultimately, while mobile money is huge, the ultimate merchant payment is most of the time still done in cash. So Africa is still a massively cash economy. I think, you know, if you argue about total volumes, I think less than even 0.5% of transactions that happen in Africa is cashless. Um, you know, so a lot of it's very, very cash heavy. Now cash is expensive. Um, so if you look at you know things from why is, why is Africa very expensive to trade with, the first foundation is dollar shortage. That's the big one of the biggest ones, because people are willing to pay play a pay a premium for dollars. So let's say you're Mickey and you're in um, you're in the UK. Alex is in Kenya. Alex is trying to import I don't know Range Rover cars from the UK to Kenya to resell, and he runs a, a shop that that sells cars. He's looking for dollars. He's not finding enough dollars. So what is Alex going to do? Alex is going to go to somebody who has dollars and pay a premium above mid-market rate to source those dollars. Because Alex knows that if he imports his Range Rovers, he can sell those Range Rovers at a premium and make a larger profit. So what ends up being created, and you've seen this in Ethiopia massively, is this parallel market rate. So other people call it the black market FX rate. Uh, it's created because there's a massive demand that's not being met. By the, because of the dollar shortage and people, because they're willing to pay a premium above mid-market rate, it starts to devalue currencies locally in Africa. And so hence why you see a lot of currency volatility across the African region. And that's that's where the challenge comes is, I mean, we as Nala, we have importers reaching out to us consistently saying, hey, the, the, the local market is this, we'll pay you five to 6% above it just to buy the dollars from you because we're bringing dollars into the market. Now, of course, compliantly, it's difficult to do that. Uh, you know, we have to follow local laws in, in different regions. And so we have to trade with the banks ultimately at the end of the day. Um, but then the banks go and resell that separately for 
to the importer, to Alex or whoever, for a premium above mid-market rate. And so I think that's what causes the, the payments to be expensive, because ultimately the people who don't have access to like that FX will have to pay premiums just to enable to source uh, the, those exchanges locally. And then even with mobile money being so prevalent in these regions, Mickey, um, the telecoms also charge premiums to service those customers. Uh, if you look at M-Pesa's volume or revenue, it was like a billion or something, you know, just last year alone. It was crazy. Um, and I'm like, man, you're making so much money off of very low income people by charging them six to eight percent transaction fees. You know, why is the most expensive place in the world to transact also charging the most amount for fees with the lowest income region in the world? You know, in the U.S., you can send money to each other for free on Venmo or Cash App or Zelle. Uh, but in Africa, you're paying, you know, just locally in that same country, six to eight percent per transfer, and you know that 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 money goes a very long way for people of that income caliber directly. I guess just because you mentioned it, Benjamin, let's just quickly touch on because it's interesting to to our audiences. I, I'm curious how Nala and you navigate such a complex regulatory landscape on the continent with, as Mickey mentioned to me before we chatted, 42 separate currencies, 54 different countries. Give a little bit more light as to how you do navigate such complexity and regulations, which is inevitable with the problem you're trying to tackle of cross-border payments. How, how do you approach it? What are the biggest challenges? And what do you foresee You know, being the biggest um, I guess, uh, enablers for you to overcome such challenges? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, one of my investors, I was, I was catching up with them yesterday and he like sat me down and he's like, Hey, cause he's, this, he's, they invested in the company three years ago. And he's like, you know what? I was talking to our partners at our fund and he said, uh, cause he had built a company before in the U S and it's, 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 it's a public listed company today. And he's one of the co-founders of that company. And he was telling me, he says, look, seeing the challenges you guys have had to navigate and build through, uh, he's like, it's, he said, I would think it's way harder to build in Africa than any other region in the world. And it basically, he was just saying, like, he was commending, like, our, our progress because he's seen some of the challenges we faced over the last three years as a business, just trying to navigate, like, in each country, each different regulation, each local law. Now, it is hard. Um you know, I wish the continent was, you know, if, if you look at it holistically from a population perspective, China, you know, and Africa, similar population size differences, one central bank in China versus 50, you know, 54 central banks in Africa, you know, India, Africa, similar population size. And I think that's the challenge because um, a lot of these borders weren't created by the African region, right? So, you know, the... One, 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 one person said the other day, uh, because of one of some of our largest volume comes from the UK and they're like, you know, what do you think the UK has done really well? And I said, well, they created the most independent states in the world. Um, and what, what, what's, what's happened is um, there's a lot of rules that, that a lot of governments have created locally, which make it really hard to trade in. And it's difficult because for us, we've applied for nine licenses in Africa. Um, the way we're operating is we receive a letter of no objection in some countries to work with a local bank in markets where we don't have a license, uh, but we receive four licenses of our own already. So in the markets that we have received our own licenses, um, it makes it a lot easier. But Alex, it took me maybe two and a half years to receive some of these licenses. So you can imagine like in startups or tech companies, like six months is life and death. Nobody's got space yeah. to wait two and a half years for that. And so... If right. you're trying to play and like do well in Africa, you, it's this long game and really, you know, working really hard. And, you know, M Mickey knows me for a while now. He, he sees how much I travel back to the African continent so frequently is because a regulator will call me. Like, let's say I landed in New York. This actually happened. I landed in New York on Thursday night and I get a phone call on WhatsApp from one of the regulators in Africa saying, hey, we want to see you on Monday morning. I'm like... Dude, I just like took this whole trip. I left one country, came sure. back, and then have to go back again. And so things like that where you're trying to do like well, and especially as a CEO, you're ultimately responsible for knowing things. And I'll be in a meeting with the central bank, and they're like, Alex, did you read stipulation 
14A of the National Payments Act of 2015, what does clause 14A state? And I'm just there like, yo, we're, I need chat GPT <laughs> right now. I need like, like someone's got, it. so I think that, that, that those complexities make it challenging to work across the continent. But I will yeah. say regulators are trying their best to make it easier. And there has been significant improvement even right. just in the last two years uh, for operating across the continent. So that's very encouraging for us. I feel like I'm, that's yeah, I, mean, I think like the Africa situation is fascinating. And I think the, the regulatory challenge is particularly fascinating because, you know, earlier when you were talking around the trade deficit, a lot of these issues are policy issues, but they're chicken and egg problems, right? It's not, uh, especially if you have a trade deficit, you don't have that much maneuverability in terms of, you know, setting your, your um, in terms of the kind of uh, flexibility you have with your FX constraints, capital outflows, for example, could devastate an African economy. That would never happen in the UK, for instance, for a number of reasons, right? Um, I guess, my question to you, Benji, is how much do you think your ex- your background, being African, being from the continent, how much do you think that helps you in identifying the problems and also identifying the solutions for overcoming these problems? Because, you know, the first question Alex asked was around, you know, building Africa and building our Africa. How much do you think your kind of skin in the game in the continent impacts the way you even look at the kind of core challenge of sending money across the region, you know, I think how, how, how does that influence you and, and what does that lead you to do, do you think? Yeah. And, and I would just add to that, like that share maybe, you know, a personal experience behind the, you know, the Nala story. What are the personal experiences that really made you aware of the personal cost of, of the pain point of having such uh, high fees, having having African Africa being the most expensive continent in the world to send money to. Just share some of the personal side that really made this an acute um, issue that led you to do what you what you do today. Uh, th- th- thanks for that. I mean, like when I came to America when I was seventeen, um, never lived in America before, and you know, for context, nobody in my family history has been to university. So, I, neither my mom or dad have a university degree or university diploma or anything like that um and for me it was definitely a place of privilege now if you look at it directly um if you look at the african continent if you hold a university degree anywhere in the world you're more privileged than 99 percent of the african continent by nature of statistics um and you know with privilege for me ultimately comes a lot of responsibility and so i used to when i i ended up working on the gates foundation in the payments team and i was looking at payments across Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and we're trying to look at what India has done with the with India Stack and Alhar, uh, where they built like an enabler for other bank accounts and services to just be built on top of you know a unique identifier per person, and we we're trying to think, okay, how what does this look like in Africa, and how do we make sure unique identifiers are created for people across the continent. And while I was working there, that's when I started to really see the challenges across multiple markets at the same time that were similar parallels. And I sent money home since I was 17. Um, I would do school jobs on campus and I'd use uh, these Hawala networks where they're like find somebody who's traveling back to Africa and like give them cash myself. I've sent money through DHL in a book um, where I sent cash in a book, closed the book, shipped it through DHL. Uh, did that a couple of times when I was an undergrad. And, you know, I've had those experiences myself because when it was, when I was an undergrad, all, a lot of the digital services hadn't penetrated like the Tanzanian market. Um, so it was either go to the Western Union. Remember, there was no Uber. There was no, so like, I didn't like, you know, calling a taxi to take me to the Western Union when it was quite, you know, or finding a bus and like doing it in between of classes was, was a lot harder. And the school had a mail center, so I'll just do it through the mail center at school and I like, didn't have to pay the Western Union fees. Um, so that's that's how I'd send money home when I was a student. Then when I went to grad school and, you know, a lot, some of these digital services like Remitly or World Remit or SendWave, which are all built into our businesses uh, today, uh, but they were newer back then. And so I was like going on a limb and trying to send money. But the reality of the fact, Alex and Mickey, is if I take you to East London, uh, and we go to a barber shop. The majority of this volume is getting sent through peer-to-peer networks based on trust. If I ask Mickey, like, "Hey, how does your family send money back to Ethiopia?" Like, 
<laughs> I guarantee you, likelihood, 80 ch- 80% chance Mickey will tell me, oh, they give cash to somebody who's traveling there. And then that 100%, this is 2020, 100% chance. This is 2024 that's that wild. that's happening, right? Wow. If I open my WhatsApp, I've, I think I've shown Mickey, but I'm in so many WhatsApp groups where it shows me like, let's say Nigerians in Boston. And I'm in this WhatsApp group where every single day, day there's trades in there of, you know, $500, $1,000 um, of people trying to send money back to Nigeria. And people are just trading to, through Hawaiian. It's like, okay, you give me on Venmo, I will get my cousin in Lagos to send it to your mom who needs the money. And so the big competition here is not even digital services. It's all the offline networks that have existed for 40, 50 years. And those are the winners in cross-border payments to Africa today because it's all established trust within communities that have been existing for a long time. Now, the second challenge is why they exist at scale is because of the parallel market rates. Is because the digital competitors will come in you know, and try to offer a service. Obviously, it's getting a lot better now. But, you know, you're competing with FX rates that are 6% better or like in Ethiopia, for example, 50% better. Uh, Like if we do formal international money transfer to Ethiopia, the rate that we have to offer based on the central bank law is 50% less than the black market rate. And so who will use that digital service when they know they'll get 50% more if $1 is, you know, $2 through a, the black market rate versus one dollar itself through Nala. Of course, you're going to find like who's going to give it to you at the parallel market. So, I think those are the things where I would see these challenges more directly. I'm like, oh, interesting. Um, you know, what can we do digitally to try to resolve some of these problems? And then, like, as regulators become, you know, more supportive of, okay, look, the money's coming to the country anyway. You're not able to track it through the black market rates. <laughs> like, what ways can we make sure that we can support, uh, like money remittance coming in, but also making sure we're not devaluing the currency um, and really try to work more with regulators. And I think more recently, the regulators have been a lot more open to that. Like a lot of regulators reach out to us because we bring in dollars to the market. They need the dollars to help um, the trade imbalance with with the lack of dollars in the market. And so I think there has been a change, but personally, that's where those are my experiences directly. And I'm like, this has got to change. I think that's it's so interesting because Benjamin, as you know, like you're absolutely right, by the way, with the Ethiopia experience, um, Alex, as I told you before, I was living in Ethiopia. And yeah, I was going to ask you about the, let's, for example, the Seattle Ethiopian community. 100%. Having the same I mean, Ethiopia of... is actually particularly yeah. interesting just on a global scale because it's maybe one of the only countries in the world without any form of um, foreign privatization of the financial services industry up until maybe, a, you know, recently mm-hmm. is starting to happen. But because of that, the disparity between the, you know, the central bank rate and the black market rate is so significant that you know there is literally no use case for it apart from some government institutions or some foreign international institutions that have to make transactions via that way but you know benjamin when you're kind of talking to me about this one thing that i'm thinking a lot about is i feel like there's two conversations right around the money situation in terms of money coming into africa then the trade piece and we've talked a lot about the external uh, capital outside of the continent flowing in, right? What about domestically? Because I think like the point you touched on with Vietnam and and, and Ivory Coast, was it Ivory with the cashew nuts? I'm thinking of another example that is probably maybe even super common for both the countries we're from, coffee, right? Probably every country in Africa imports coffee. Most coffee is probably grown in, in, in Africa. Lots of coffee is not is not a material that's you know you don't do a lot more production to it of course you do in some instances but i'm sure there's a ton of coffee that's imported into africa via a european or an asian or a, another country as a middle point subsidiary without any production being done and i guess part of that is to do with the lack of trade flows between the two african countries for instance how much are you guys working to fix that challenge between ivory coast and nigeria how much are you guys working to make sure that the trade there is as seamless as, you know, Ivory Coast to UK or wherever it may be? Yeah, I think the challenge with intra-Africa trade is two things. Uh, and you're absolutely right about a lot of those goods and services are already produced on the continent. The challenge for me lies within two things. Number one would be logistics, uh, which leads to the second void. So intra-Africa logistics is a nightmare. Mickey, you know, getting from 
Dar es Salaam to Senegal, I have to, or like, let's say Dar es Salaam to Cape Town, South Africa, right? I have to go Dar es Salaam, go north, fly three and a half hours to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, then fly five hours down all the way to Cape Town because there's no direct flights between both. And so and I imagine a good in service getting transported on a lorry or a, even a plane, right? So the cost of that trade, you know, even with logistics, I'll give you another example. There are, let's say, two Swiss, Swiss air flights from Zurich to Tanzania a day, for example. And um, how, how, in that same flight, it's the same amount of time, like it's double the time for a lorry to leave Nairobi and drive all the way to Dar es Salaam, then go to like, you know, go through customs and so on and clearance versus a flight flying all the way from Zurich to Dar es Salaam and getting cleared. So I think the logistics being difficult on the co continent and the lack of intra-Africa, like enables the lack of intra-Africa trade because the cost of doing business remains high. So until uh, like intra-Africa logistics increases and becomes better and becomes cheaper, there will still be a lack of that. Now, which is the second point is the cost of price because those countries are importing in bulk. Like let's say France is importing coffee from, or avocados. The Netherlands, for example, imports flour uh, flowers from Kenya uh, at scale. It's one of the largest importers of flowers from Kenya. And, you know, because they're importing at scale, they can buy it at bulk and then resell a lot cheaper versus Tanzania buying a lot, lot smaller amount from Kenya. And then because it's a foreign um, import, they're willing to pay in dollars and can pay with dollars immediately versus Tanzania sourcing dollars to just pay for that flour locally. And from the country next door is a lot harder. So you will see exactly what you said. Like the, the goods and services go to this country and then just come back to the country where that was right next to it and makes no sense. Uh, but I think those are the two main reasons why. And so until like logistics starts to increase across the continent and become better uh, and cheaper, it will lead to a lot more intra-Africa trade. But that that that's that's why, you know, it, it, it's, it's more sad. Like those things, you know, what am I doing about it is, you know, how do we also, as we build payments infrastructure, at least make sure the payment cost is a lot cheaper and more like faster for people to just do the wire between Kenya and Tanzania, for example, or Ethiopia and Eritrea um, or other regions of the world. Um, but yeah, instead of having to go to Italy and just to come back to Ethiopia. It's a, it's a bit like uh, when you go buy water in a supermarket, you know, like a small 330 milliliter water is like two pounds and a big one liter is like 50p, you know. But actually, then you when you actually look at the scale issue, that becomes a lot more telling of that reason. But I think that is probably also just super interesting. Do you ever see like, are you starting to notice people using your solution for intercontinental trade though? Do people even? So we have, I had this a uh, billionaire across East Africa reached out to me and started WhatsApping me and he uh, he asked me, he's like, hey, look, I need help. I was like, what's up? He's like, I need, a, I need to buy a billion dollars worth of USD a year. He's like, can I buy a hundred million a month just from you guys? And I'm like, I can't even service his demand. Um, because, you know, if you think about this person's business, he operates in 14 countries in Africa. He's trying to move funds within those markets around. It's not easy. You've got to pay some high bank fees. The banks don't have enough dollars in the market. So people like us who bring in dollars to the region, people like them who are importers are willing to pay premiums to buy those dollars from us. And so um, we do have a lot of demand that unfortunately we're not positioned to service yet um, You know, today. And, and th this is why I think... You know, with Nala, what, what I really focus on and I, why I don't call this remittance business, but more payments infrastructure business is because if we're able to build payment rails in these local markets and enable more dollars to be brought in, for example, I talked about Instagram creators uh, or influencers, right? There's no influencer in Africa today that can get paid on Instagram. Um, so how do you enable all those local M-Pesa disbursements for a service like Instagram? And then if that brings more dollars into the market, then you help, I mean, it's small, but, you know, bringing 300 more million dollars into Kenya is materially massively more, more different to the economy. It helps reduce trade imbalances, dependence on foreign debt, capital flight, you know, and then limited access to global financial markets, uh, which weak the currency ultimately. But I think those things would help, um, you know. So I think baby steps like that is where I see the impact of knowledge being created. Uh, long term, okay, it might be two hundred million dollars next year, but what does it look like in five years? Is that a billion? Um, you know, what does that look like at scale? Like, as let's say with remote work, right? 
as more work starts getting outsourced to the African continent, let's say from early jobs like customer support, you know, that enables people across the continent, maybe who service European businesses because of same similar time zone um, to get paid in USD. Like India had that historically, the Philippines is really big for that. What about the African continent because of the similar time zone or maybe software engineers across Africa, right? As technology starts to grow, you know, who's enabling those remote payments to, and like, I think that's a whole economy that's created of bringing dollars into the market. And I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, to me, that's, that's such an incredibly uh, promising use case right there. And I think uh, that was going to lead me, you already led into it, but I wanted to talk about the business payment side of, of Nala and that, you know, you're, you're aiming to build payment rails for the world to trade with Africa, obviously rails that would support such, um, you know, payroll type um, use cases that would support hiring globally uh, from the African continent and open up a whole new economic wealth of opportunity to workers in Africa, such as what you mentioned. But what is what is really like the, in terms of the tech you're focusing on here, because obviously technological barriers um, and just infra, you know underpin what infrastructure can do so or can't do. So uh, you mentioned you, you mentioned you know you you have an ability to source quote exceptional FX rates for African businesses transacting across borders. You offer competitive rates, same day or next day settlement times, but these are kind of becoming increasingly the talk of the town, table stakes. So, what will set Nala apart in the new world of of these payment rails that are emerging, and what technology sort of underpins the future of the network that you envision? and how it can serve the continent in the most efficient, secure, and cost-effective ways that won't be, you know, beaten out by some other solution or have big, you know, gaps in, in transparency or compliance that will hold it back. What is really the ideal sort of, sort of path ahead of you guys here? Yeah. The way I look at it is back to the Range Rover example. Uh, you can have a Toyota Camry take you somewhere and you can have a Range Rover take you somewhere. Um, you know, people might argue that, okay, or a Tesla take you somewhere for what it's worth, right? The Tesla might be more like fuel efficient because, you know, you're charging an EV battery, you know, and you can make all these arguments. So similarly, the way I look at payments is, um, I also tell our team, um, I don't want users, I want customers because you will always have somebody build something cheaper, uh, than you guys. There's always going to be somebody who raises VC money and comes like juices effects rates and like tries to get a bunch of customers in. But then I, th I asked the team, like, okay, are we thinking long term? Like, if we can't have people pay for goods and services, there's no business there. There's no business that we've created. There's no business that we built. I mean, let's take a look at the UK, for example. 2020, uh, like, look at UK fintech. Everybody has a different strategy for scaling, right? Initially, Monzo came and said, we're on a mission to create the world's best current account. And we're going to give people hot coral pink cards, charge people on interchange fees, make a revenue that way. Um, and then you have Revolut. Same started similar times and Revolut focused in, initially on remittances. They were doing remittances from the UK to like Eastern Europe. So like Poland, Estonia, a lot of these markets. But they also initially right at the beginning, they said, hey, let's create other things. Let's create crypto. Let's create trade. Um, you know, let's create a current account as well. And everybody's like, oh, Revolut's so distracted. They're not focused. They're not trying to do one thing and one thing very well. But then the pandemic happened and all of Monzo's interchange fees and revenue basically died, went down, and Monzo almost died as a business um, because they were relying solely on building the world's best current account. And then whereas, you know, Revolut, you, one can argue, diversified its revenue streams and like enable people to pay for goods and services in, in other ways. And today Revolut's worth 33 billion, Monzo's raising around at $4 billion today, right? And they started at similar time, time periods and have, have raised similar amounts of money as, as businesses. But, you know, one would say they'd rather own Revolut versus Monzo, et cetera. The, way, the same thing with payments. I think ultimately the problems we see in the way Nala like diversifies itself from, from what's table stakes in the market is, is around a few things. One is with payout success rates, they're very low um, today across the region. And so some of the local payout providers who just quickly go to market. Um, and as you mentioned, I think, Alex, a very important point is you can only build as good as the services are built locally. So if you're integrating with a local bank who has garbage APIs, then that's the best you can yeah. service. But then, you know, how are you supporting and making sure that you're communicating that this bank has garbage APIs to the customers trying to disperse that and tell them like, hey, 
by the way, we think the payout success rate is going to be 70% versus promising, hey, it's going to be 100 and it's not 100%. And then get creating mitigation strategies for when, hey, Alex is sending this money, please warn the customer in your payment flow that there's a chance that the payment's going to fail. So I think there's a lot of, whether well, it's just error code mapping, people would pay a premium just for error code mapping. Whether it's float balance checks, name validation checks, user account balance checks, those things um, is what we built for our consumer product. And so because we had that issue with our own consumer business, we're like, okay, let's enable this for other B2B companies. Now, if you look at customers who use Rafiki today, so Rafiki is our payments infrastructure project, rafiki-api.com. Um, those customers were all using some other service and we're not the cheapest, but ultimately over time, the time and cost saved for the reliability they're, 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 they were gaining with Nala, people came back to us and like, okay, cool, let's use Nala. And we've not had a single customer on Rafiki leave us yet uh, so far. Um, and I think it's because yes, we're not the cheapest, but the reliability and cost for them to hire extra people in a call center because payments went down um, we would still save them net more money uh, by using Rafiki. So, that, so that's kind of how I think about it. Um, and you know what, like Alex, I think there's going to be maybe nine or 10 types of people building a Rafiki equivalent business across the continent. And I think they're all going to be massive because 54 countries, we're not going to be able to serve all 54. Maybe we'll serve five or 10 really well. And who's going to do the others? And so I think there's still an opportunity for, for other companies to be built even today that could be even bigger than Rafiki and what we built. You, you mentioned a, a sort of a dependency on, on banks and their crappy APIs or, you know, things that might, I guess, uh, pre pre prevent a, a, present a little bit of a roadblock in terms of, uh, you know, technology being a true enabler and streamliner of, of sending money globally. Do you, do you see progress in terms of the, I guess the regulatory acceptance of new forms of payments, whether it's digital assets or CBDCs or crypto, do you see that as being a particular benefit for your business and your customers in the near future or far future? Yeah. I'm a big fan of crypto. I'm not convinced that it's needed for Africa today. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll tell you, at the moment you're licensed and you manage the word, mess m just mention the word crypto, it's over for you. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. We Will it always be like that? I, I mean, is, is that going to be the case for the next you know, five years? I think it will be the yeah. case for the next five years. Uh, I hope it changes mm -hmm. over time. Uh, I definitely think more governments are starting to be open to digital currencies. The challenges uh, of what people are afraid of is what happened in Zimbabwe, enablement of capital flight because of political instability, corruption, weak institutions in some African countries that lead to capital flight where wealthy individuals and businesses move their money abroad, often in dollars, which drains foreign exchange reserves locally in the market. So I think that's the challenge of what people are worried about. It's like, okay, cool, if they can purchase digital assets, are they going to do that anyway? The reality is it's still happening regardless, right? So if they can regulate it and like know how much is actually being moved, like it's maybe in the government's benefit. But I think that until... There's a large education done across many central banks about the pros and cons, and it's very clear versus today, the perception is immediate negative. Um, so I think until that happens, uh, it's not going to change anytime soon. I hope it does. Um, and then with the with the banks and technology, I think that's a massive problem. Uh, banks across the continent don't have big tech teams, don't focus on building tech well. And so I think yeah. that... Un like a lot of these banks are using systems from 20 years ago, um, like that they invested a lot of money in 2005 to build and they want to invest a bunch more money to like upgrade it and pay a bunch of money to, to get it up to world standard. And so I think those will still cause challenges for all of us trying to enable trade with those banks. Can I ask you, Benjamin, yeah. just one quick question on the crypto piece, right? I feel like... Because you, you you know you talked about the kind of challenges with the a cultural piece maybe with the regulators, but the thing I find with the crypto question with Africa is, does it solve the problem that you've identified and we've talked about so far, right? Because part of the challenge is the lack of access to the FX currency, right? So it doesn't do because I think that's the yeah. the big issue with Africa. I guess is the liquidity pool is the lack of competing currencies that are needed in that high right. demand right so what does crypto do i'm not sure that it necessarily does that much for it, that piece 
yeah, I, I think you're right. Uh, you know, I think if you look at the why, uh, like why do regulators sometimes make, maybe get concerned about crypto? I think the first one would be like lack of regulation and oversight. You know, crypto operates in a decentralized and unregulated environment. So the lack of regulation raises concerns around consumer protection, financial stability. Uh, the second one would be around volatility. Uh, crypto markets are highly volatile, like have rapid fluctuations here and there. And like, what can that happen? You know, even tied with that with consumer protection. Um, third one would be like governments really think, try to think about who's evading taxes and, you know, who tax evasion or, you know, regulatory arbitrage that people are trying to optimize for. Um, and then, you know, global concerns about what that could lead to. And so, you know, reality is a lot of those things are still happening today in the market. Um, you know, and, you know, if I were regulated, I'd lean into like trying to understand what ways we could use crypto to like at least maybe create some controls around it because whether they like it or not, it's still happening. Um, you know, the, if you go to localbitcoins.com, people are trading large amounts in all these countries today. Um, so, okay, it's still happening, you know, and so I think um, the liquidity problem will still be there, Mickey, um, because uh, like when will, will this trader who's moving $6 million transaction use crypto for that? I don't know. Will like will that will that importer in France use you know for a ten million dollar trade to to Congo, do that on crypto? Maybe I don't know. So like I think when until that gets to a point where it feels safe for those large trades, the material difference is not going to be there. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's interesting hearing that from your standpoint. So this has been a great chat, Benjamin. Thanks so much. I just wanted to wrap it up with I guess. Talk to us from the founder perspective. Um, what are some? What are the lessons you've learned, and what did you wish you knew more about when you started your journey building Nala? And then, what's the biggest challenge you personally or Nala has faced along this journey? And some takeaways you could share with the audience, just as a, as a closing point here. Wow, lots of lots of really big questions there. Um, why do I? So many lessons learned. I mean, every week I'm learning so many new lessons <laughs> and I think a few things, I think ultimately it boils down to just really trying to fall in love with the problem and try to understand as much as you can about the why behind things. Because when we were starting out Nala, every investor told me, you're getting involved in a minute says this is a super crowded space. You're not going to succeed. 80% of our investors told me this is going to fail. Like literally, like because we were doing something else before, when they invested, we and then we pivoted to remittances, and people were like it's not going to work. There's these six companies that are worth a billion dollars. You're never going to be able to compete with them. You're not going to have the volume. Payments is a volume game. Therefore, you know can't source FX better than them. And that was all I was given. Now, if I listened to that directly and like just you know was convinced by what they said, I wouldn't have even built this company at all. We would have probably shut down the company when we were pivoting and just like maybe been working on something else. But I was so convinced because I'd spoken to enough banks and enough people to understand the problem enough that I'm like, you know what? I actually don't think they understand this problem to the scale I do. And really honing in on the problem, I think, is where a lot of founders can do really well versus what is traditionally told to them. So I always, you know, Mickey seen my WhatsApp because he'll sometimes text me like, dude, you haven't replied. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. And like on my personal WhatsApp, I have 1,400 unread messages because some of these are customers reach out to me directly as Benji because maybe I met them when we were starting out. Somebody shared my phone number. But it also allows me to stick close to the customer and monitor these user behaviors. And I think the founder, whoever's building any company, should be the closest to the problem because they'll understand unique insights that's going to help them make good decisions for the business. So that's one of the biggest pieces I would say. And I tell that feedback to any founder or people, somebody trying to work on something. Don't read some random article, like go and understand the problem yourself. Um, and until you do that, like you're going to be in a whole league of your own. And then the second thing is when building, I don't know, I tell this to my team all the time. I say, look, when you're building a company, ultimately for the function, like you're, you're leading at the organization, if you don't take responsibility, you take orders. And I think that's a principle of life. And so whether it's a function you're responsible for at work, I don't want to give anybody orders, but I do expect them to be the expert and master of that way better than I am. Um, and I'm not supposed to be the person knowing everything about every single part. Like if I'm an, I'm not supposed to be this treasury expert, you know, I'm not supposed to be the fin crime expert, you know, but, you know, as you start a company, you are that 
initial expert, but then, you know, Paul Graham from Y Combinator says, you start with generalists, you scale with specialists. Now when I'm bringing in specialists, I do expect them to be way better than me at that. So I think that's the, the, one of the biggest things I would look at and, you know, not just for Nala or starting a company, but for anybody else in whatever role, whoever, whoever's listening to this is, you know, just try to be the best at that function uh, you can be and really take ownership of what you're responsible for. And I think you'll do well. Love it. Love it. Well, anyhow, um, Ben, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this was a great talk. Mickey, thanks for being with us as well. As always, your insights are add so much flavor and depth to these conversations. And uh, Benjamin, wish you all the best. For Nala, we'll be watching as you expand and grow. And um, thanks for, for sharing all your story and, and your vision. It's amazing stuff. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Mickey. Very kind. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, guys. 